And now it's time for the Everlasting Gospel. Welcome to the Everlasting Gospel today. I'm Gary McDay, the host of the program. It's my privilege to welcome you to the Everlasting Gospel. Today we're going to be studying the topic entitled, Is the Sinner's Prayer from God? You know, we've seen a lot of literature that can be picked up in restaurants and various places and little tracks that have, if you want to be saved, pray the sinner's prayer. We have a lot of friends and good friends who will say that the way to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is to pray a sinner's prayer. And they give a type of prayer that is to be prayed in order to be saved. Well, today we're going to look at the question, is the sinner's prayer from God? We should always want to do God's will and to determine what God's will is in every facet and phase of our lives that we might be found pleasing unto him. This is a serious point today because it is the point at which a person is saved that we're talking about. And our friends will say, you're saved at the point you pray the sinner's prayer. Then you are saved. Well, is that the case? Is the sinner's prayer from God? Now, what I'd like to do first is I'd like to show you some passages of Scripture on the topic that uh, Brother Wendell Winkler, I used to love to hear him preach, and he would say, let's begin with some unclassified passages on the topic. And he would just quote several verses of Scripture. Well, I'd like to begin the lesson today by setting out some verses of Scripture from the Bible that pertain to the topic. The first one is from 1 Peter chapter 3 at verse 12. In this passage of Scripture we read, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and... His ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now let's go to another verse, this time in the Old Testament, Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayers of the righteous. Another verse in Proverbs, this time 28, 9. He that turn away, turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. And then John 9, 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Now just a moment on this passage of Scripture in John 9, 31, and we'll come to the three points of our lesson today. You'll notice that here this, this man was a blind man. He's been healed. And the Pharisees were saying that Jesus was a sinner. Well, they all knew that God does not hear the prayers of sinners, likely from passages we've looked at in the Old Testament, such as Proverbs 28, 9, Proverbs 15, and verse 29. So they all agreed that God did not hear sinners. The question is whether or not Christ was a sinner. And here, since he had healed this blind man who'd been blind from birth, well, now then he couldn't be a sinner. God would never hear his prayer if he was a sinner. And so the affirmation, we know that God does not hear the prayers of sinners. He states this negatively that way and positively. If any man be a worshiper of God, he's the one that God hears. In other words, as we've seen in other verses, a righteous man. So the Bible has clearly told us that God does not hear the prayers of sinners. So as we begin to look at the question is the sinner's prayer from God, we can already see the difficult study that we have, the difficult search that we have to try to find a sinner's prayer being acceptable to God because we've already seen verses that tell us God does not hear the prayers of sinners. Now, those who advocate the sinner's prayer, I'd like to begin by repeating something that I heard from Guy in Woods, and he made the statement that the sinner's prayer is illogical. Now, usually those people who say we're saved by the sinner's prayer, by praying the sinner's prayer, they will say you're saved at the point of belief only. Now, the moment a person believes he's supposed to be saved, or if that's true, that person could never pray a sinner's prayer, could he? Why no? He wouldn't be a sinner anymore if he was saved at the point of belief only. So what they'll tell people is believe and you're saved. Now, pray this sinner's prayer. That's illogical. You know something is wrong. You know something is tangled up from the very beginning when you listen carefully and respectfully to what these people are teaching. It is just simply not from God. Is the sinner's prayer from God? Let's look at three reasons why we are saying that no, the sinner's prayer 
is not from God. But in the first place, let's consider this. First, can we know when something is from God? Well, certainly we can know. Absolutely we can know if something is from God. Hosea 4 and verse 6, the prophet said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And in Hosea 8 and verse 12, God says to the people, I have, given, I have written unto him the great things of my law, and they were a strange thing to him. So that's one reason sometimes people don't know whether or not something is from God, is because they are not looking at the law of God. But we can certainly know when something is from God. Now let me give you an illustration of what we're talking about by going to the Old Testament book of the Judges. In the book of Judges, we find a theme in the book of Judges to be this. In Judges 17, 6, and then the last verse of the book, 21, 5, uh, 25, the writer says that in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You see what the problem was during the period of the Judges? Everybody did what he or she thought was the right thing to do. And it did not correspond to what the written word of God was. They had the law, but they were just doing what was right in their own eyes. I think that in our time, we've come full circle, and that's where we are with most people, at least most people of my acquaintance. They will say, well, I know I'm right. Sometimes I'll say, because I feel it in my heart. It's right in my eyes. This is right to me. Uh, I recently, a friend of mine, I believe he's a friend of mine, I hope he is, he made the statement he said that my testimony, my personal testimony, is irrefutable. And he means that it's what he believes. And therefore, a man from outside couldn't refute that because it's what he believes. Well, it's certainly and clearly what he believes. But these personal testimonies need to be compared with what the Bible says. And you'll find that the idea of giving a personal testimony ought not be done anyway. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul writes... Those comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. You know why? It's the problem of the book of Judges. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. We become our own source of authority when we say that our personal testimony guides and rules. And we tell others, look, you do what I did because this is my testimony. Not because it's from the Bible. Sometimes that's never mentioned. But my testimony is this. And if you'll do what I say, you can be saved. So there is a problem with this. How did that work out in the book of Judges? In the book of Judges, they began to worship Baal and Ashtaroth. It's not working too good when every man does that which is right in his own eyes. You can even, even read in the book of Judges and see how that the Philistines usually were the perennial enemy of Israel. and They would come in and oppress the people so badly that God would raise up a judge to deliver them. And there are 12 judges there in that book. Then also you remember a time when a man sacrificed his own daughter. How's that working out for Israel, for every man to do that which is right in his own eyes? Why do you think we have this book of the Bible today? Well, of course, it's to tell us this important segment of Hebrew history. But also it's to let us know the pitfall, the danger of doing what is right in our own eyes. We therefore need to consult the standard, and we believe the standard to be the Word of God. Remember, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I've given them the great things of my law, and they were a strange thing unto them. We never want to be so estranged from the Bible that we can't appreciate what it has to say. Over in our New Testament, we're told that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, and we are told that it is our source of authority. It truly, that is, completely furnishes us to every good work. My grandson is talking to my son and I saying, you guys always preach from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I'm glad he notices that because in our day and age, those are key verses of scripture to promote to the public and to remind the church concerning. For in this passage we read, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So there you have the inspired word of God furnishes us. So it should be like in the days in the Old Testament when Isaiah said, To the law and to the testimony, for if they speak not according to thy word, 
It is because there is no light in them. If they speak not according to the law, it is because there is no light in them. We should speak in harmony with the word. First Peter 4 and 11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. So the first thing I want to notice with you in our study today and trying to answer the question, is the sinner's prayer from God, is this. Can we find what God's will is for us today? And that's what we should be seeking out. We would answer with a resounding, absolutely we can know what God's will is for us today. So that's the first thing for us to think about, is are we doing our will? Are we doing what is right in our own eyes? Or are we seeking God's will? When we're talking about matters of salvation, we have them clearly detailed for us in the Bible. And we should be going to the Bible for our answer. So is the sinner's prayer from God? Our answer is no, consistently no, because we do not find it in the Bible. Never was a man told, after the, in the days and after the days of Christ, never was a man told to pray a sinner's prayer. I asked a man recently, would you show me the kindness of showing me the sinner's prayer in the Bible? And he paused for a good while and then changed the subject. You know why? Because he's a very smart man. He knows that's not in the Bible. But yet he left me without the courtesy of showing me where it is in the Bible. So that's something very serious for us to note. People can't show us the sinner's prayer in the Bible because it simply is not there. Let's look at a second line of reasoning in this connection. And for that, we go to the Great Commission passages. You know what I mean? In the last of each of the synoptic gospels, as they are called, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have a statement where Jesus commissions his disciples to go into the world and to take this message of salvation to everyone for all time, to every place in the world. This is standing orders from Christ. And you'll notice what they say. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus makes the statement that all authority in heaven and earth had been given him. And then he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all the way, even to the end of the world. Now, this is the Great Commission. This is what he's told people from the first century till now, and as long as this world stands, to do. It can be summarized under three headings. Teach, baptize, and teach. That's what the Great Commission holds. That's Matthew's account. Look at Mark's account in Mark 16, 15. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, what did Jesus tell us to do there? He said to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And then he tells us the one who believes and is baptized is the one who will be saved. It's not hard to see. Very clear. Well, somebody says, I don't believe that. Well, he made it plain when he said, he that believeth not shall be damned. This is all we have to go on, the Great Commission and what Jesus said about it. Now let's look at the third instance. This is in Luke. Luke chapter 24, verse 46 and 47 here, Jesus commissions them to go into the world, and he tells them that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached. How is that remission of sins acquired in baptism? Acts 2 and verse 38. So I want you to notice now, these are key teachings of Christ. They are threefold in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They are for all people, for all time, and they are consistent. We're to go, and the message to be declared is the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. People should learn enough about that from the teaching so that they are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But wait a minute. It is in baptism that we are baptized in the name of the sacred three of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means that is the moment that we enter into a personal relationship with deity, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are baptized into their names. 
and we are added to the family of God. You can see that in Ephesians 3 in verse 17. We become members of the family of God. Now then, a lot of times I hear people talking about the sinner's prayer, and they will ridicule baptism. And they'll say, well, baptism is a certain thing, but what you need is a personal relationship with God. And they'll say, to get that, you pray the sinner's prayer. Now, the sinner's prayer is not the Bible, but we're telling you you need a personal relationship with God, and that's the way to get it. We're telling them something that is not in the Word of God. But when we teach the Great Commission, and a person has learned to the point where he is willing to be baptized, he or she are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I affirm that that is as close of a personal relationship with God as you can get, and it is accomplished in baptism as taught by Jesus in these Great Commission passages. And you see in all of them a consistency about that teaching. To all people for all time. Notice that. Teach people to be baptized and then continue to teach them. And thus this relationship that we have. When we have forgiveness of sins or we're baptized to be saved, we learn in Romans 6 that we're baptized into the death of Christ, baptized into Christ, Romans 6, 3 and following. Now, if you're talking about a personal relationship, You can't get more personal than that, than to be baptized into the death of Christ, to meet the Lord there, to obey that form of doctrine delivered us. Romans chapter 6 is dedicated to that entire point. And I would recommend the study of that for those who are hearing me say, is the sinner's prayer from God? And I'm answering no. Well, what do you have in its place? Read Romans 6, and it will explain it in good detail for you. And I think be a real eye-opener because one of the things that we have in common with those who are teaching the sinner's prayer is this. We are concerned about the lost. We know that Christ is the Savior. We want the lost to be saved, and we want to have an impact upon people with our teaching. We have that in common. But in order for us to be united and two walk together except they be agreed, Amos 3.3, we must be teaching the Word of God And the consistency of the Word of God in the Great Commission is where we all need to be. We find in the book of John chapter 8, in verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, it is the truth of God, the Word of God, that makes us free from sin. That's why... We can't teach a sinner's prayer. It's not from God. We teach the Word of God. That is God's Word. And now we can be leading men and women to Christ. And we can rest assured of our own salvation at the same time. Because we can read what to do to be saved in the Bible ourselves. And reassure ourselves with these words from God. Now let's go. That's two lines of reasoning. Let's go to a third. In this third line of reasoning, we have the gospel plan of salvation as presented in the New Testament. Now, I have pictured, to assist those of you who may be listening to the audio, a series of steps. And I have, across the years, been criticized for talking about the steps in the gospel plan of salvation. But I think such criticism is wildly unwarranted because in Romans 4 and verse 12, when Paul is talking about us being children of God, children of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ, He talks about us walking in steps of faith along with Abraham. Abraham took steps of faith. Each step he took was directed by the Word of God. Well, that's what this little chart does, is it shows you the steps and the plan of salvation that may be taken, and when taken, a person can be saved, can enter a saved state. Let's look at these steps as presented in the opening chapter of the book of Acts. Now, the reason I want to do this is because this follows up point two that I made with the plan of salvation, rather the Great Commission passages. We follow that up with the plan of salvation. Here's how the apostles taught that initially in the second chapter of the book of Acts. Have you ever thought about the book of Acts? The book of Acts can be known as a book of conversions because what it is is the apostles who themselves were guided into all truth by the Holy Spirit uniquely so. Those promises to be guided into all truth were not for everybody. 
They were for the apostles. If you'll read John chapter 13 to 16, you'll see that very clearly. His promise to send the Holy Spirit wasn't to send it to the individuals like people believe today, but to the apostles of Jesus Christ. They were guided into all truth. And what they said was what Jesus had taught them during his personal ministry and what Jesus continued to teach them through the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, we find they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Who? The apostles, Acts 1, 26. And starting with chapter 2, they begin to tell their audiences of people, whether an individual, a few people, or a multitude of people, they begin to tell them the gospel plan of salvation. In Acts 2, there is a multitude of people assembled in Jerusalem on one of the Jewish feast days known as the Day of Pentecost. And the apostles implement the teaching they had received from Christ on that occasion. And you'll notice in our chart the first step. They were told by Peter, you men of Israel, hear these words. Now as they listen to the words of Peter, they're never going to hear him say, pray a sinner's prayer. But he says, hear these words. In verse in the um, book of Acts also, in chapter 8 and verse 37, we find that they were taught to believe the gospel with all their heart. And these people clearly did in Acts 2 because they were convinced by Peter that they had crucified their own Messiah. And they cry out, what shall we do? And in Acts 2 and 38, they get their answer, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins. They were told to repent or turn away from their sins. And they're taught to repent. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Notice that step of faith found in chapter 8. And then the next step, and I put it red if you could see on the television, because baptism is into the death of Christ where he shed his blood, John 19, 33. And they are to be baptized for the remission of their sins. That is how the teaching of Jesus was implemented on the day of Pentecost and elsewhere in the book of Acts. They were added to the church by the Lord that day. That's the place of the church. Jesus adds you to the church that he built starting that day. He promised it in Matthew 16, 18. It's fulfilled in Acts 2. And these people are encouraged to be faithful unto death, to be saved. Acts, or rather, Revelation 2, 10. They didn't stop with baptism. They're to be faithful all the way unto death. Now, with that in mind, let's look at the broader picture of the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, you can find 10... I'll call them case studies of conversion because what you have is, of course, the teaching of what to do. I've given you that in the steps. But here you'll have personal examples. Like, for example, on the day of Pentecost, it was specifically stated that they were to repent and that they were to be baptized. We've seen that. They acquired from that, received from heaven, the remission of their sins, the forgiveness of their sins. That is one of those case studies of conversion. There are nine others that result in baptism. Now, I wish we had time to step through the entire chart. Acts has 28 chapters. It is a book that is a unit that is written to show what we do to be saved. You can see that when the Samaritans are converted, Simon is converted, the eunuch, Saul himself, and others through this book. One of the things that all of these case studies of conversion have in common is They all result in the baptism of the candidate, the person who is seeking salvation. That is impressive. Is the sinner's prayer from God? No, it is not. Here's what's from God. The teaching to believe in Christ, repent of sins, confess faith in Christ, and be baptized into Christ for remission of sins. That's what's from God right there. That's what is to be taught where? Everywhere. To whom? Everyone. All nations. Mark said every creature. That is for all time and for every place. That is what is appropriate to teach people to do to be saved. You've got Bible on it. Some people really want to know. I want to know a little more about this. I want to study in depth. I have people sometimes say, well, I want to think about that. All right. If you want to think about that, get your Bible out. Start with Acts 1. And just simply read through the book. And as you read through the book of Acts, you're going to 
those 10 case studies of conversion where there's meaningful discussion, full discussion about what they did to be saved, baptism is always included. It's not something done occasionally or after they're Christians. It's something that is done in order to be added to the church in order to be saved. So here you have these 10 case studies of the book of Acts. What is the purpose of the book of Acts and of these studies? The objective of this teaching was to persuade people to become Christians. That is how they do it in the Bible. And in churches of Christ, ladies and gentlemen, that is how we do it today. Letting people know you can read about this right in your own Bible. We're not supplanting the Bible and saying, well, it'd be easier if we just, just tell people to believe only. That's, believe only, that's the main thing. And now pray a sinner's prayer, not in the Bible. That will get it. No, it won't. It is not from God. And we've shown you that along three fronts. Now, I want to mention something to you. We just finished talking about case studies of conversion in the book of Acts. Let's look at one of those being the Apostle Paul. Before he was Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was going to Damascus to persecute Christians there, and he met Jesus. Notice what was said when he is talking to Jesus on the road to Damascus. Jesus gave him an order, a command. Go into Damascus, and it will be told thee there what thou must do. Now, we're in Acts 22. When he gets into the city of Damascus, he, is, he there meets a man by the name, a preacher by the name of Ananias. And when Ananias seeks him out, he goes in and guess what he finds Saul of Tarsus doing? He is praying. The Bible says he is praying. Is he praying a sinner's prayer? No, he is praying. Is he saved from that prayer? No. He had not yet done what Jesus said he must do. Now here's a man praying. The preacher comes in and sees him. He is sent by Christ to teach him the gospel. And what does he say to him? And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So here is a man that is praying. We've got an instance before us, is the sinner's prayer from God? And we're saying, no, it's not. Here's a man who's praying. And he is told to arise. He stops him from praying. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's how you call on the name of the Lord. Not in prayer, that wasn't getting it, but in baptism. So the only case we have in the Bible of a man trying to pray for his salvation, he stopped from praying and he's told to be baptized. And if he does that, he'll have his sins washed away. Acts 22 at verse 16. I think that's significant. And if I was one who was teaching, pray the sinner's prayer and you'll enter a personal relationship with Christ, I give serious consideration to the things we've discussed today. And I would look up those verses in Acts 22 and prayerfully consider what is being said here to a man that is praying. He stopped in his prayer, told to arise and be baptized. His sins will be washed away and he'll be calling on the name of the Lord. Is the sinner's prayer from God? No. Thank you. For